Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us New York Times bestselling author and Emmy Award winner, Leah Remini. Leah, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Leah, last week's news was so exciting. Season three of Scientology in the Aftermath. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is exciting. It's exciting and also troubling, as you well know. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I read Tony's blog uh, today. We're at uh, March 26, 2018, Monday. I read mm-hmm. Tony Ortega's blog this morning when I get up. And December 2017, just a few months ago, you and your dear friend, uh, Jennifer Lopez, were filming in New York, and you're followed by a Scientology private investigator. Yes, of course, they're denying that that's um, happening. But yes, and... Uh, You know, this is what's unfortunate about it is, you know, it's not just me, you know, it's Tony, it's anybody who is speaking out and telling the truth. There's other contributors who've been on our show who, you know, just recently their trash is being stolen and things are continuing to happen to them and it just doesn't stop with Scientology. But, you know, they should know that we're not people who are going to go away because of that. And, And I know a lot of people ask, like, well... You know, if you know about it, why are they doing it? You know, it's like, shouldn't they be, you know, secretly doing this? No, this is part of their tactics is to, you know, make themselves known as people who are being followed or your garbage being taken or um, being stalked and harassed. Um, You know, they're doing now the, they're, they're going to other family members now and trying to get them to say that I was abusive to them. And, you know, it just doesn't stop. With them, and and you know, as you well know too, you know, people's, you know, they're still not talking to their children. Their children are still not talking to them. You know, this is a a, a gift that keeps on giving in Scientology. <laughs> oh, and, indeed, and L. Ron Hubbard called it uh, an, a noisy investigation for new right. Scientology watchers. And there's a lot who who, who came out because of your show. And yeah. uh, for them, the, the church, just by way of background, the church operates what's called the Office of Special Affairs. And it's their bureau that specializes in intelligence, legal, PR. And they're the ones that hire the private investigators. Or just, or just uh, plain old parishioners who they, they have, you know, harass people on social media. That's their full-time job is to do that. Yeah, these are their OSA volunteers. And Correct. then they have their professionals. Right. Now, uh, Karen and I, my wife Karen De La Carriere, uh, who was a longtime member of the church like you, we've had the private investigators follow us. We've had the squirrel busters out to the house. Mm-hmm. And they know we're not going to give up. And, and yet Hubbard's policy demands that, that they try to intimidate you, harass you, uh, go through your garbage, do things like that. This goes to the heart of the question you're talking about, and we've been talking about, the use of tax exempt dollars to engage in harassment, intimidation, psychoterrorism, right. hate websites, things like that. And that's something that, that I've been focused on for years and, I, and, and you're bringing to the attention of the public. That's my money. That's your money. That's my stepmother, you know, my stepfather's money. That's my mom's money. That's what people are, they're giving and contributing to that thinking that they're ending something that's hurting mankind. Well, I I don't think they think that we're not going to stop. I believe that they believe that eventually this will get to us. And these intimidation tactics, because they they did work at a time, you know, in the 50s, it did work. It did silence critics. It did silence the IRS. I mean, (laughs) this is how how Scientology um, received their tax exempt status is by bullying the IRS. Certainly. Certainly, and that's a, that's a great untold story of what really went on to that, that I, I, I hope all the details will emerge, and I think they will eventually. Um, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of, Leah, I have contacts in the U.S. government. That's all I'll say. The Church of Scientology knows it. And I can tell you, I was told by an IRS insider that your show created shockwaves inside of the IRS. It is on their well, radar. Well, you know, that's... I- that's great, but you know they they need to man up and they need to just like do something about it. So it's all well and good, you know, all this talk about you know we're paying attention and we're well they need to do something about it. They need to literally get their heads out of their asses and do something about it. 
There's only three people in the U.S. government who can call for an investigation into Scientology's tax exemption. Startling. Right. That is startling. There's only three people. And anybody who's ever owed the IRS, you know, $2,000 or $10,000, I mean, they don't give up until they get it. No, they don't. So I think <laughs> we have to exert political pressure on, on our mm -hmm. elected and appointed officials. Television is a very powerful medium to do that. Leah, one of the reactions Scientology had, and it's, it's not a good reaction, was to create something they called Scientology TV. So I wanted to ask you a question about it, but I want to give it context. Sure. Okay, now, you starred with Kevin James for nine seasons, 207 episodes mm -hmm. in The King of Queens on CBS. You've won an Emmy as a producer of Scientology in the Aftermath. So as a television network star and as a television executive, I wanted to ask you this, what is Scientology TV? Because it's not a network, it's not a television station, it doesn't have a broadcasting license. What exactly is Scientology TV from your perspective? Well, it's like any business, it's a commercial. And that's it. I mean, I can't, I don't, I can't see it any other way. It's, it, Scientology has always run as a business. It should be treated as a business and it should be taxed as a business. So, so you as a television professional, when you look at it, it's clearly not television as we understand it. It's just business infomercial. It's a commercial. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't know how anybody could see it any other way. Um, <laughs> however, this is a dangerous, harmful, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any more, adge I, I have tons of adjectives, but I try not to um, curse. Um, it, it's, it, I, I just don't understand how it's, it's able to, um, other than, you know, they're paying for it, and again, person or money, um, to advertise its false claims of what it does and who it is. Exactly, and look, but look at the disjunct, and this is something, I know Scientology will be listening to us, David Miscavige will be listening to this interview. You can't have it both ways. You can't stalk Leah Remini, spy on Mike Rinder, harass the guests of the show, put up hate websites, and then expect the public to watch your so-called Scientology, Scientology TV with all these happy people. It's phony. It's just of phony. Course. I mean, yes. And, and again, it's their attempt at, you know, because they only have their policies to follow, it's their attempt to, you know, we've already debunked everything that they claim to be. Um, so has the the hundreds of thousands of people who used to be in Scientology and are no longer in um, say it it is a fraud. No, it definitely it's is a fraud. Yeah, and it's it's a harmful, hateful organization that is promoting itself as the complete opposite, and then going after people who are telling the truth. This is just I just saw it as a commercial, but the fact that it is even able to air with all the abuses that have been documented and the pain that it causes people. Remember, this is an organization that charges its members. And I don't know how many times I have to say that, but it seems to be a point lost on a, a small group of people um, because I think the, the public at large know, get exactly what it is which is why it only has 40,000 members worldwide at best. Sure. Um, but it does have a lot of money because it, it, it um, defrauds people out of their money. But it's a pay-before-you-go business. So it's not something that people are attacking because it's free and, oh, if you didn't get anything out of it, move on with your life. People have given their life savings to be Scientologists, their time, which you can't get back. Because Scientology is an everyday thing. It's two and a half hours a day minimum, a day. The dedication it takes to be in it. And on top of that, the hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, that it costs a parishioner to be in it. It's not free. It's not free. No, it's not into, in, in a classic fair game operation that Scientology is running, 
they're going to push back on you and your program and your guests because you're threatening right. this this business. And Correct. L. Ron Hubbard had a, had a saying that um, he said he called to depopularize the enemy to the point of total oblivion. Correct. Which, which is not working for them, obviously. But right. here, but here, they here, believe that. They do because they can only robotically operate off Hubbard policy. They think that right. character assassination, slander, libel, stalking, harassment will ultimately shudder critics into silence. So right. they, they want their free speech, but they don't want anyone to have their free speech. Correct. And, and the more effective you are as a critic, the more heat they're going to bring. But, but right. this is the, the power of the, the power of the Internet is that we can we can expose all this on a real time basis. Now, what's interesting to me on your show, The Aftermath, is the high quality of, of the production, the research, everything you do. Uh, because you've got you've got a multi-billion dollar uh, cult with lawyers breathing down your neck. So you have mm -hmm. to. So so aftermath is bookended beginning in commercial Scientology denies everything that's on this show. Everyone mm -hmm. is not telling the truth. And those disclaimers are are, are are necessary because for legal reasons. Right. But what they're what, what, the, the, what the disclaimers are really saying is we as Scientology are not willing to communicate. We're not willing to come on the show. We're not willing to put anyone on the show. But we deny everything. <laughs> I, look at, I look at the disclaimers as saying Scientology is supposed to be about communication. Back when I did courses in the early 80s, it was to make you know the able more able and to mm -hmm. improve your communications ability. And they don't. Well, no, they can't confront it because that's, a, that's the, 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 the simple truth is they know that it's true, which is why they can't have anybody come on our show. They couldn't debate Scientology with somebody who knows Scientology. Oh, not at all. So it makes total sense why they have taken the position that they've taken because they know they cannot come on face-to-face -face with me or Mike or you or anybody who know Scientology and say that's a lie. They, they know they can't do that. <laughs> they, they can't do that with people who know that it isn't a lie. Yeah, and one thing I've said for a long time as a critic, uh, in, in, you know, I grew up in the Christian church and there's a field uh, in religion called apologetics. And that means to make a reasoned philosophical defense of your faith. You're able to say why you believe in God, for right. example. Now, Scientology yeah. has no apologetics. What they have is PR, right. PR and fair game. And to your point, no, they couldn't have anyone on the show uh, to, to, to bait you, Mike Rinder, or anybody else. So right. that's why they go to the character assassination. Now, right. I listened to your interview the other day with Chris Shelton. It was, it was fascinating. And you mentioned that um, you're going to extend out into, into other religious groups that harm people. Right. This fascinates me because what I've been, I'm writing a book about Scientology and uh, oh, good. that's, it's, was a secret for a while because, uh, you know, I wanted just the privacy of being able to work, but I am writing a book about Scientology. And what I'm focusing on, Leah, is this same thing about a cult, an evil group hiding behind First Amendment religious protections. But, but what I've noticed in my work is there's an unholy fusion of American secular contract law, copyright law with religious protections. Right. And that's what we're up against. It's kind of a hellishly perfect protection for a, a malevolent evil group like Scientology. Right. And so the more... And my thing is, yes, exactly. My thing is I don't ever want to attack somebody's religious beliefs where it's helpful to them or, you know, having faith is a beautiful thing, but where it harms another where you call to separate families and you brainwash people into believing that if they left, their lives would be destroyed for not only this lifetime, but for eternity. And you make victims, and I'm talking children, believe that they are responsible for the horrible things that happen to them as children. If it's, if it's um, being molested, if it's being raped, if it's Anything like that, these cults and the, this, this ideology is that it is your fault. 
that you did something to make that happen to you. And this is what we're teaching, that you do not believe, uh, you do not trust the police. You do not trust uh, to to go and report these criminals. Um, and if you do, you are, um, in Scientology law, certainly you are um, sinning to the highest. You will be expelled. Your whole family will leave you, you will lose your business, you will lose anything and everything that you've ever known. These are things that are harmful. These are things I do not believe fall under, um, should fall under religious protection. We should be protecting our children. Um, we should be able to say, hey, if you're running as a business, you promised me this, it didn't happen, I should be able to get my money back. Um, and like you said in the beginning, it's it's you cannot have it both ways. You cannot run as a business and then hide behind, hey, this is our religious beliefs. Uh, we discussed when I, when I was on season two on your show about Scientology as a business with Luis Garcia, yeah. Ted Babbitt, and Matt Pesh. The first yeah. thing that Scientology does is it strips. When you become a Scientologist, there's an intake system. And, and I became interested in investigating that. How do you become a Scientologist? There's a misperception in the public that you can walk in and throw down $100,000 and get auditing. That's not correct. What you do is you sign four basic contracts that strip you of your civil rights. You cannot sue. You do not own your right. auditing folders. They can lock you up. It's what I call the kidnap contract. And they could, not, they could, they could um, take your, your confessions out of context and put them out for the world to see out of context in any way, shape or form. They, they, you know, they could do anything they want. If you are um, having a psychotic break and you're under a uh, psychiatrist's care, they, like you said, they have a right to remove you from that. Um, if you're in the sewer, you have representation. You don't need to speak for yourself. Am I wrong? Uh, no, you're correct. In, in, in fact, the, the, as early as 1964, L. Ron Hubbard designed Scientology legal mechanisms to to strip people of their rights to sue or to have an attorney. Right. So when you join Scientology, you agree never to involve an attorney if there's a dispute. And you, you, you know, you, you, if you do go psychotic and some of their processes can and have driven people psychotic, they'll lock you up in what's called the introspection mm -hmm. rundown. So it's, it's a very nightmare Orwellian group. And mm -hmm. this is why I'm glad for your courage in, in bringing this out so people can say, how monstrous is this? How deep does it go? Leah, you, you have had the same experience I've had. You know, I've, I have about 60 podcasts now. Do you know the heartbreak of interviewing survivors and what they've gone through? And mm -hmm. that feeling of, oh, my God, this just keeps getting worse and worse. Yeah. As you peel back the layers, you, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. And, and I don't. I mean, it really is heartbreaking. I just did a podcast with with a young lady named Katrina. She was 10 years old in Siberia, Russia, and her mother got into Scientology. They went to Moscow and then to Flag Land Base in Florida. Katrina is a 10 year old girl in the Sea Org. Mm. And it goes down from there, you know, because when she gets into puberty, yep. uh, she gets sexually molested. Yeah. She gets made, she doesn't, she's denied an education. She has to yeah. work as a janitor. And wow. and then they threaten her with disconnection from her mother, who's all she has is her mother, right? Right, of course. Yeah. And, and so these stories go on and on. And what you've done so powerfully in your show is to allow people to tell their stories, to give them voice to those who would otherwise be voiceless. Well, the fact and, that they're willing to speak, as you know, is, is the more courageous of the two. Um, because... It's, as you know, there's repercussions to their telling their stories. And, um, you know, I always have maintained that. That's not so much me, but the people who are willing to tell the story. Pain, and this pain goes on and on and on. It's like what happened to her has happened to many. And this, there, there's not even an organization there going, you're right. We did that. We made you guilty of the crime of having something horrific happen to you. It's just horrible. And one thing that is wonderful that has come out of your show, Scientology in the Aftermath, is the Aftermath Foundation. Could you tell our viewers 
our listeners what that is and how they can contribute well, Mike, to it? Well, Mike, well, Mike started that with Louis Garcia and I, I believe Aaron Smith-Levin and a few others. I think um, Ted. I think Ted's involved with it, but um, they started this foundation for people who were leaving Scientology or cults like it and really had no resources. As you know, you know, it's a very small group of of Scientologists who've left who are there for other Scientologists when they leave. And I don't don't know if people know that because people go, well, what happens to them? How do they get on their feet? You know, it's like um, Mark took in Mike and, uh, you know, um, so did Mary Kahn, you know, they, they, she helped Mike and, and, um, and Rathbun. And so like, there's a community of people, ex exes who are willing to take on these people and help them when they leave. Oftentimes this is just, this just came out of the niceness of their heart in their own pockets. Right. So the fact that, um, you know, now they have enough, a foundation that it, it's there to support those people. It's there to help them get on their feet. It's there to help them to to reestablish themselves. And these are people who, who have left Scientology. Now, when you're in the Sea Org and you're thrown out of the Sea Org, you get 500, if that, and you're on the street, you don't have job skills. You can't really put on a resume, I worked for Scientology for right, ten, exactly, ten, right, 10 right, years. That, right. It, 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 right. So the Aftermath Foundation will help them recontextualize, you know, because I've helped former CIRG members with resumes to say, look, look, it's not that you were a cult member. What did you do in the cult? What are your job skills that translate to help them acclimate, acclimate back out here and in, into life? And one question I have for you, Lee, you, you were you were very successful in your TV career. But when you left the church, what what real life skills did you have to develop after you left the church? Well, that's still happening, Jeff. I mean, that's the thing. It's like it just doesn't go away. You don't just learn. Like, you know, I was in the real world. I was lucky that I was in the real world even while in the church. So I had a, you know, semblance of outside life, right, but still living this insular life in a weird way, right? Sure. But I'm still learning. I'm still learning you know, to, to, to be in the, in the free world, as I call it, <laughs> with, without judgment, without thinking there's an agenda, I should help this person with Scientology and, you know, all that stuff, the, the, the tapes that go off in your head when somebody says something and, you know, how you kind of have these circuits of like, oh, that's that, oh, that means that, oh, that means mm. that, oh, this person needs help, oh, that person, you know what I mean? Oh, I know exactly what they're doing. They have an ulterior motive. Because it, you know, and it's all all of that that you learn in Scientology. You know, you learn to be an attack dog in Scientology, even not even just as a Sea Org member, but just as a person. You learn, and and they teach this. The outside world knows nothing about life. Doctors know nothing. Psychologists, evil. Psychiatrists, the most evil. Like you, you just you become a person who's so above it all, who, you know, even if you, you, like me, only had an eighth grade education, you know, you believe you know more than everyone. And that, you have to unlearn that. That's not something that just happens overnight. I'm still learning that. I'm still learning to sit and listen to people and be compassionate and, and not squash that side of myself that I had to hide for so long with being a compassion, a compassionate person or someone who had empathy for the world and not think, oh, that person pulled that in. That person they did that, that, that horrible thing happened to them, and that's because they did something for that to happen to them. You know, these are all things that you have to unlearn, and it doesn't happen overnight if you were raised in it. I mean, even the way you talk, you know, you, you, know, you so think in Scientology lingo that well, no, you have to unlearn it. You have to unlearn it. Because you were indoctrinated. And, uh, you know, my brief experience in Scientology, there was a course called uh, Upper Indoctrination Course in TRs. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I mean, they're explicitly telling you that they're going to indoctrinate you with this Upper indoc upper Indoctrination. <laughs> Allergies. Oh, oh yes. no problem. I, I know what you're going through there. And, and by the way, I spent thousands of dollars on something called the Allergy Rundown. Go ahead. Oh, no. Tell, what, what's the allergy rundown? Mm, the allergy rundown is because, I, you know, I had allergies since I moved to California. And, 
I believe it was things that I have done to things that I'm allergic to. I, I don't recall it. Yeah. Um, but at the end of it, you're not supposed to be allergic to those things. Uh, the, Lee, and, this is so screwball. Yeah. They have mm-hmm. rundowns for everything. They, but it didn't <laughs> work. But but I'll tell you, at the time, you believe yourself. You, you lie to yourself that it worked. You believe that it worked. Well, sure, right. you have, you, I, you I had you a I had a Catholic priest the other day. Uh, he asked me, "What what is it about Scientology? Like what what do you think? How does it how does it get people?" And my Angela, my husband, actually said, "It's because in the beginning they actually have things that you can apply in your life in the beginning, right? Yeah, things that are actually like it takes something." And it says here, you can actually do this in your life as opposed to have faith. You can actually see it working. Sure. Right? So here's this thing that you can actually apply. Here's a tool to apply to your life. Things like how do you talk to somebody who's angry? How do you talk to somebody or how do you persuade someone to do something? Right? And so they teach you these, these little manipulative things to do in life to to achieve a goal, right? I mean, that's not the way it's positioned, that it's manipulative, but it's a communications course, you know, yeah. where you learn to look somebody in the eye. That's not a bad thing, right? All of us want children uh, to grow up who can look somebody in the eye and talk to them and acknowledge them, right? We don't want to hear aha uh-huh every two seconds from a teenager, right? So they teach these, they have these teachings that take common sense things and put them in the form of a, of a course, so you go, well, that was helpful, right? We can all agree these little courses are helpful, right? They come from other places. Um, they exist other than in Scientology, but because none of us are really educated in Scientology, we don't really know that, right? We don't know that these things exist. No. And, and, and so you feel like you've got this magic. You're like, wow, I never heard. This is amazing. You start to feel so... Above it all, you start to feel that you're a cause of life, which is the purpose of Scientology, make you think that you're the cause of everything. Now, that's very interesting. That's pretty powerful, right, to think in it, those it, terms? Like, hey, it I could be the cause of my own life, and I could turn my own life around. These are not things that, that you know, people sh- go, that's horrible, I don't want that. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, not at all. And, and look, self-help is good to learn. And the, 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 the things I learned in my time in Scientology, I would describe them as self-help. Yeah. But I, I'll, I'll give you an example, Leah, that's interesting for me. Uh, I, I, I was in sales, and I took courses where, in sales where uh, you, you make eye contact with the person you're talking to. You listen right, like to, big league, big league sales stuff. Well, it, it wasn't really less Danes. We never did oh, the okay, hard, okay. hard close. This was relational selling, mm-hmm. which is different. Scientology, oh, I yeah, yeah. Scient- yeah, Scientology yeah. is the, the hard close. But it teaches you to look at people in the eye. It teaches you to to be comfortable with a person, eye contact, yeah. and really listen to what they're saying. Right. And mm-hmm. and and that's just a function of being polite, being very polite with a customer to establish a relationship. To right. let them know you're listening to what they need Trust. and want as a client. Uh-huh. Yeah. No. So uh-huh. when I did Scientology courses, I thought, oh, these are just like the sales courses I was doing. Later, right. I, would, I would learn that Aaron Harvard took them out of uh, other content. But if I hadn't had that training, I wouldn't have known. And it would have been very valuable for me just to make eye contact and be with a person. Sure. So what's right. happening on the lower levels of Scientology? You're you're, you're learning things that are self-help that will that will help you in life, but but they're slowly linking that to Scientology. So your identity is becoming a Scientologist, and then it must be a Scientologist in good standing. So uh-huh. as you become more capable, you also become more of a Scientologist, and like you said, they then they start stripping out the compassion, no human emotion or reaction. Stop being sure. reasonable. Produce the result. Right. Uh, and in Scientology, reasonable doesn't mean what it means in the real world. Reasonable means um, letting people get away with things. Correct. So, <laughs> yeah, you don't, you, you don't put up anyone's justifications. You know, there's no... Yeah, there's I mean, no, if somebody's yeah. crying and, you know, is late because my grandmother died, it's like if you sat there and you were 
compassionate, and you said, no, I totally understand why you're late, you would be considered being reasonable, which is a bad thing in Scientology. They'd say, you know, don't care. Your grandmother's already off to another life, and it's just a body, and, like, let's move on. Isn't that appalling? You would be... Yes, but that is what we're taught, and, you, and you've heard this before. Why, are you, when, when I was a Scientologist, people would ask me, why are you not robotic like the rest of them? And that is what we're taught, is to be robotic. You know, you show compassion, and they think there's something wrong with you. They go, what the hell is going on with you? That's just amazing. You know, so, so for them to be uh, turning around and saying, you know, what they're trying to do now is uh, get people to say that I was abusive to them. Scientology teaches people to be abusive. I'm only a product of what Scientology had taught me. Um, th well, yes. This is what we do to each other behind the scenes as Scientologists. We were always abusive to each other um, because that is not being reasonable, and that's, that's the desired um, attitude as a Scientologist. No matter what they show you uh, publicly behind the scenes, uh, Scientologists to Scientologists, never, I'm not even talking about fewer members who are horrific to each other physically, mentally, but as Scientologists, this is what you are to each other. You're not compassionate. You're not taught to be that person. And you'd be looked down upon if you were that person. Sure, and that's the entire culture of snitching, of writing uh, knowledge reports. <clears throat> yeah, and by the way, if you see somebody, a Scientologist acting compassionate, it's an act. I mean, I see it right through it. I did it myself. You know, it's a, it's a PR it's a PR move. <laughs> let me let me ask you about that. You know, the, when I began studying Scientology, I was amazed at how overwhelmingly concerned public relations is. Oh, that's everything. Words. PR is everything, of course. PR is everything. You know that. It's the yeah, but, appearance of. Well, sure, I learned I learned that, but I, I never realized until I really started studying Scientology how much PR is all-consuming. Uh, Aaron Smith-Levin told me a story of an older man who was at Flag Land Base who was on the property to get some auditing, right? And he had a stroke. Uh-huh. So instead of calling 911, they drag him out and put him on a bus bench so he doesn't die on the property because that would be out PR. Sure, everything is about the PR of the church. But that's the policy, too, is to protect the church first. So now when you do your show and expose this, you're an enemy. You're hostile. Right. And they have to deal with you. And and coming back around to Scientology TV, I, I, pre I predicted, I knew what would happen. They open up with uh, David Miscavige making a statement that we know you're curious about Scientology. No, David Miscavige, we're outraged about it, actually. We're not mm -hmm. curious. We're outraged. And right. then, th then they open with this couple, uh, the Deerings and their banjo company. And I thought, well, that's a safe opening. Who, who hates banjos, right? Uh -huh. Then they go to the Inglewood Org, you know, in the Afri African-American community helping. So, you see, I, so I'm watching it as they're opening Scientology TV saying they're staying safe, they're staying safe. But then it quickly devolves into an attack on, psych on psychiatry. Right. And then it, it evolves into attack on psychiatric drugs and, and sure. you know, the whole thing. And you had mentioned with Chris that you were getting therapy. And, uh -huh. but so many Scientologists who leave are afraid to get therapy because you're taught that psychiatrists and therapists are evil, the most evil beings in the universe. Right. So how hard was it for you to, to, to get the help you needed? Well, it's, it's, not, it's difficult because, you know, as you know, um, you know, it's very hard to, to open up after something like that because you realize when you leave that everything you have confessed or tried to work on um, in Scientology is being used against you out of context. And uh, so, you know, your trust, something you've been raised in your whole life is turning against you when, you know, which is shocking to me, you know, even still I was naive about it thinking, well, wait a minute, they know I'm telling the truth. So why are they attacking me? You know, like I was still shocked. Like these people are telling the truth. Why are you attacking them? You know that. So like, are you that evil? It's like hard to confront that kind of evil. Right. 
Mm-hmm. It's like we always want a reason why. What's the reason why? Why do people do evil things? Why did they do it? Why? You know, it's, it, it, you shouldn't understand why, you know, because why should we try to understand evil? Um, but uh, it's not easy to then open up after that, after you've been burned, and you've been burned over and over again, and you see what they're doing continually to de- hurt people and destroy their lives by taking their family from them. And um, that's the most painful. The discrediting part and all that stuff, it really is, is so childish, it's not even worth commenting on. Um, but it isn't an easy thing to then open up. And I have to tell you, it's been a beautiful thing to sit across from somebody and have them say, Yes, you know, these things happen to you. You have to see yourself as someone who was taken, you know, as you, you were taken. You were you went in it with a good heart or you were a child or whatever the circumstance, and you were a victim, and it's okay. You know, we're taught, you know, in Scientology, victim is the worst thing to be, right? Yeah. But in the real world, to say that you've been victimized, it's okay. And then even further from that is, you know, step uh, away from that is that you're a survivor and then you turn into an activist and you help to heal others, you know, so there's many stages of this, but I, I just find that Scientologists don't really like to uh, call themselves victims or receive help after that. And look, even for me with my therapist, you know, uh, I'm like, Oh, do I tell her this or do I reveal this side of me? Is she going to use this against me? There's always that peace, you know, mm, of being yeah. complete, completely vulnerable with somebody that, you know, when you've been vulnerable to somebody, meaning Scientology, for 35 years, you know, that's not an easy thing to go, all right, let me trust you now, a complete stranger. But um, it, it's it's gotten me on the path of, like, being... You know, allowing myself to feel the things that I never was able to feel. In Scientology, you're not allowed to uh, talk about the things you feel is bringing you pain. They go, yeah, that's not, we're not going to talk about your dad leaving you at a young age. We're not going to talk about your dad being physically abusive or mentally abusive. You know, we're going to talk about when you've done it in another lifetime, when you've been a bad father. But literally, I mean, these are things that you're talking about. You never get to say... I didn't have a father, and the father that I did have was abusive and horrible. And, I, you know, I think a lot of my issues stem from that. Like, you can't say those things in Scientology. Yeah, you're never healing the parts of you that you went into something like Scientology for. So you're just driving that, them down deeper to become more of a Scientologist. Right. More, more of a domineering, aggressive you know, mean ego driven narcissist narcissist i mean all these things i mean it's just you know it takes years to unravel and i'm not even saying that, that you will unravel it but you have to start the healing process you have to start doing the things that that you should have started with in a therapy you know it's like your 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 past how you were raised yeah, and that and that's the fundamental thing that the one of the fundamental things Scientology destroys in a person is trust. And, and yes. like you said, it is hard It is hard to trust again when you've had this malicious cult destroy your trust, take advantage of you, lie to you, con you, manipulate you. Uh, take your money, it, take your life. Yes, but you know what? You have to do it because the way I looked at it is like, look, the worst has happened to me. <laughs> the worst has happened to all of us. And so you got to take that other step now and get and get the, the the help that you were looking for your whole life, you know. Which is as an adult, I started to look for, you know, hey, I want to heal these things that are that I do every day that actually affect my everyday life. But as you know, you don't get to deal with that. Then further, as you get into Scientology, you're told that you're made up of many many spirits. And so you don't even really get to counsel yourself. You're counseling these other spirits in your Scientology career when you get to the confidential level. <laughs> I mean, sure, because you're so you're, hand, you, you're handling your so-called BTS. Right. You're you're what in Scientology is called body thetans, which is other spirits that your body is composed of, and you're just never dealing with yourself ever. So you so you become you become more. Uh, in, in, in 
psychology, there's a word called splitting, dissociated. These kind of these kinds Correct. of terms. Yes. So, so you can become very profoundly lost and alienated from yourself in Scientology. Yes. yes. And the the longer you're in, the more alienated and profoundly lost you can be. Yes. Leah, Leah, can I tell you just a short story? Sure. I, I, and I want to ask you about it. I was at a gathering once. Um, Mark Headley and Jason Begay had a party at Venice Beach. Okay. Everyone could come, whether they were independent Scientologists, hated Scientology, critics. It just everyone showed up, right? Yeah. And um, there was a couple there who were both OT8s, a, a, a married couple. They were young, right? Uh -huh. And the woman came up to me with her, her husband, and he, he looked lost, completely lost. And she said something happened to him on OT8. Yeah. And I don't know what it is, but I don't have my husband anymore. And he told me that he was a member of a, a flying saucer crew who was trapped on Earth. Right. And, I mean, he was very sincerely telling me this. Yeah. And and I, I was tr having reverence for him, like, this is a, a man with a problem. Yeah. And she's saying, she's saying, what should I do? Should I go into Scientology and get him this other rundown, this other repair. And, <laughs> and, and, I, and I told her, if Scientology did this, more Scientology is not going to fix it. It's just going to make it worse. Right. He needs psychiatric, psychological intervention. Right. And, and Agreed. I, I could see her, how much she, she dearly loved her husband. Of course. And money was not an object because they were wealthy. Right. And but I could see her struggling with how do I take an OT8 to a therapist? She yeah. said, I will get we will get kicked out of the church. I said, if you love your husband, and you want to save him, you have to get him help outside of Scientology. It's only going to make it worse. Now, right. I don't I don't know what happened to them. I don't know right. what, what became of them. But but, but Leah, this is the kind of thing that happens on the upper levels of Scientology when you're dealing with body thetans and you get right. you get into this system where you can't really deal with what's really bothering you. I don't know. I, I'm not a therapist. I don't know what the real issue with this man was. Yeah. But I just saw the barrier that Scientology had erected for his wife to get him the help he needed or for him to get the help he needed. Right. And... Yeah. To me, when I saw that, it was just staggering. You realize the, the profound disconnect between Scientology and, and what we call real life out here. Yeah. Now, when they yeah. when uh, I follow Twitter very carefully, you, you are a hashtag, hashtag Scientology, the aftermath. Uh -huh. And it's very fascinating t to watch how many people of goodwill are are you've raised their awareness through your show. Right. And the work you and Mike have done is tremendous in raising awareness. But I also watch the people who are still in the church struggling, trying to get their message out. Yeah. And one of my guesses, and, and, and you know David Miscavige, you dealt with him. Mm -hmm. What is David Miscavige's purpose in launching his Scientology TV is I think he's trying to counter your show. Oh, of course. But, you know, already people are not curious. That's like you said. People are not curious. They're very aware of what this organization is doing and what they continue to do. And, you know, if this was a, you know, an answer to the show, it certainly isn't. And it's certainly not succeeding in its goal to, oh, well, now, I mean, now we know what it is. I mean, this is all the stuff that was in the events that we've seen for years that we've already debunked, like I said, so it, it, it's nothing new. Um, but if they think for one second that coming out with this ridiculous commercial is going to do anything to me or Mike or the show, it isn't. As well, their petitions, as well, their stalking PIs, as well as Scientologists attacking us on social media and our contributors, it's just, it's, it's having zero effect. It's, it's actually having an effect in that uh, we're just going to continue, and um, you know, with with 
with much more passion. Uh, you know, I had never intended for the show to continue. I thought we had done enough to expose it, and the authorities would take over. The IRS would start looking into tax exempt status. Um, our government would look at this as an abusive cult and do something about it. I mean, these things haven't happened, and so obviously more work needs to be done, and we'll continue to do it. And I applaud you for that, and that's what I'm working toward as well. And and all of us who listen, who we all yeah are contributing. You're you have an amazing website. I love the work. You know that I love the work that you and Karen are doing, and have done before before us. <laughs> Um, it was Chris, with everyone, Mike, Mark and Claire, Mary Kahn, our contributors uh, from last season. I mean, it's just been uh, everybody contributes to this motion. Our supporters of the show, supporters of your site, of Mike's, of every, you know, Mark and Claire's book, of your book. This all means something. This all contributes to exposing it. We're all part of the one motion. It's not sure. just me, it's not just you, it's not just Mike, it's not just Tony. You know, it's everyone, and everybody is, is so supportive of each other. And it's like, yes, fine, you take the torch. Okay, great, you get that, you know. Yeah, exactly. It, do, it, it does take, it does <laughs> take a, a large group of, of people who are willing to do this work. Uh, bless you. Yes, and thank you. The, and the work is often thankless. Yeah, now, it it. For us, for us, for me, this is why I got into and stayed into Scientology because I thought I was helping. And we all have this um, gene that we want to help and we want to do something. So uh, we're all doing it. And and that is our thing. Yeah, but that's okay. Listen, they don't affect anything that we do. Yes, they exploit that, but eventually, you know, having 40,000 members worldwide is not a success story. (laughs) No, it's Did not. Did you sneeze fact, now? Uh, yeah, I sneezed. It's oh, like, bless you. <laughs> it's like I need the, the allergy rundown, I guess. <laughs> no, you don't. It won't work. But here's something funny. Now, uh, here, in my, uh, here in my studio, Surviving Scientology Radio Studio, I have on my monitors, right? And I have on Scientology TV. Here's, yeah. here's a couple things that just cracked me up. Yeah. Um, and that's why I started my OT It Is Great Satire blog, because if you don't laugh, you'll cry, right? Yeah. So I, I have my serious work on the Money Project, my laughs over there. Okay, I, yeah. I have on Scientology TV. Now, it's streaming through YouTube, live mm-hmm. streaming on YouTube. So, first of all, that's a big failure. You're not a television mm-hmm. network if you're live streaming on YouTube. <laughs> Sorry, okay, Dan, I don't know. Not... A... <laughs> well, you don't... It's like they're they're saying we're a TV network. No, CBS is a TV network. Live streaming right. on YouTube is a YouTube channel. Right, right. I have I have a YouTube. <laughs> Karen and I. Right, right. Our, our YouTube channel has seven point. Okay, we have seven point four million views. Okay, mm-hmm. on our humble little. So they're a YouTube channel. That's what Scientology TV is. Now, right now, they're right. bashing psychiatry. Right. And here's what they're doing right now as we're talking. They have on a guy named Jim Mars. Now he he died last year, but he was uh, like in in the year 2000. He wrote a book called Alien Agenda, and uh-huh. it's about the ex- extraterrestrial activities in the past and right now on Earth. Uh-huh. And David Miscavige fell in love with Alien Agenda, and he ordered everyone at the Gold Base and the Imp Base to read this book, Alien Agenda. Uh-huh. And so I'm thinking. Why do you have this conspiracy writer on Scientology TV who wrote Alien Agenda, who thinks extraterrestrials are working among us right, right now, and and you're attacking psychiatry? And this <laughs> this is supposed to be <laughs> it's like yeah, it's I don't, listen, this is a train some wreck. things so, some things <laughs> some things you just can't note. You know, I always say like. It's something so bad, I just can't note it. I can't begin to make it better because it's just completely lost from the from the minute it started. This is one of those things. It's, it's silliness, and I can't even spend no. two seconds. It's just ridiculous. And, again, it has nothing to do with what we're doing. It's like if they're winning so much and they have 
they are the largest growing religion on the on the planet, like they say, and they have millions and millions of members. They should not care what a has been actress or Mike Render is doing or any contributor on our show. If we're so uh, lost and we're so ridiculous, then why bother? Why bother? Just keep on winning. Keep on winning Scientology. Yeah, keep on keep, doing keep on, what you do. Yeah, keep yes. on going with the alien Illuminati psychs from the planet far but, sec. But, but for Good. my purposes and for what the yeah. purposes of, our, of, of what we're doing, what you've been doing, what your wife has been doing, what Mike has been doing, what Mary Kahn is doing, what Aaron Smith Levin is doing, what Tony, like every contributor we've ever had on our show is telling the truth. And we will continue to tell the truth as well. Like and we'll continue to do our what we do, and you can continue to spread lies, and continue, and we will continue to expose it. And the public will see it for what it is, and that's why the I was public so has happy. already seen it for what it. Listen, the public was telling me when I was in, Leah, how are you in this crazy cult? I mean, so the public already knew, <laughs> but, but a bigger public than ever now. Exactly. And yes. That's why I was so excited when season three came. I was actually, yeah. Leah, I was actually so disappointed when I loved season one and two. And when it ended, I thought, wait a minute, we're not through. We need more. Oh, we need thanks, honey. More. Thank we you. do need more. Thank you. And so I'm, you. I'm so pleased that you're doing season three. And I know you're busy on your new show uh, with, with Kevin James and you got so much going yeah. on. And uh, but I was so glad that you're doing season three because I think it's it's important and Thank you. you you have an army behind you, Leah. I know, I know, I know. I know. I couldn't people. tell you. How, I cannot tell you how grateful I am. Oh, and we, I, I've always maintained that, and and you guys have always been so loving and supportive, and and thank you for all of it, and and to your listeners, to I I hope they continue to support the show, you and everyone who's been speaking out, who has spoken out in the past, who will speak out in the future. Uh, their support is amazing, um, and like you said before, you you asked me about the aftermath. You know, any contribution that people can give to that organization uh, is amazing. It doesn't matter what it is, but but even if you can't do that, just being as supportive as the public has been is enough. And and we'll support it. We'll support Aftermath Foundation. We've been promoting it. Karen Thank and I you. will promote it further. So. Thank Leah, you. thank you so much for being on the show today. Honey, it's my pleasure. And we it's look my forward. pleasure. Thank you for having me. Win another Emmy on season three. Oh. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I, I, and I got to tell you, when you won that Emmy, you were up against yeah. Anthony Bourdain. James Lipton. And I love him. I know. Listen, I uh, was like, oh, well, he hasn't said that. all my new fans. <laughs> oh, I, I, yes. I, yeah, I love Anthony Bourdain, but to yeah. but to win against Neil deGrasse Tyson and James Lipton and Anthony Bourdain, that was yeah. a statement from culture and from, and from the Emmys that you're doing something that makes a difference and that yeah. you're world, world-class television. Thank you, honey. So we'll look forward to season three. Thank you, we, sweetheart. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch. <laughs>